we call this session unscripted because it is exactly that. We have developed no script. Um, I wrote down a few questions that would be good to talk, talk about. I've, I've showed them quickly to the other panelists, and they said, that sounds like it's a good reason to do so. Uh, we'll start with a conversation here among the three of us, and then at some point um, turn to the audience and, and uh, uh, get in questions or, and quick comments from everybody. For those of us who work in the energy area, We've got to always remember why we're, why, when we talk about a sustainable energy system, what do we mean by that? And one of the elements of sustainable is treating the only world that we have that we can, we, we now live in, in a sustainable way. And that has a lot to do with global climate change. So we're going to talk about just energy and climate change. And I'm going to be jumping us back and forth between a few questions, sort of in a, in, in a maybe a, a what way may look a little random. And if it looks like the questions are random, actually you perceive correctly. The questions probably are a little random in a way. But I want to start with, with one thing. How much do we know, really know, about climate change? Uh, is there significant uncertainty that really we should be taking into account? Uh, and what's the nature of that? Now, let me turn to Chris first on, on that. Uh, a, a few comments about, you know, what do we know and what don't we know? Sure. You, you know, one of the things that was dramatic about the 2013-14 reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, if you looked at the projections and you compared those with the projections from the 2007 reports of the Intergovernmental Panel, they were about the same. And the reports of 2007 were slightly larger magnitudes of climate change than from 2001. The thing that's striking about our understanding of climate change is that the projections have, in general, been very stable. The message that's the key take home is that we were right in 1990, we were right in the 1995 report, we were right in the 2001 report, and in the 2007 report. There are two things that are, that are new on the scene, and it's important to remember those. One is that we have a much clearer understanding now than we had even a few years ago of the extent to which we're already experiencing impacts of climate change. And those are really consequential everywhere around the world. And only a few years ago, real impacts were mainly hypothetical. So in, in many ways, climate change has advanced out of the realm of theory and prognostication into to real experiences that are impacting you and you and every country in the world. The other thing I think that's become super clear with climate change really only in the last few years is the extent to which it expresses itself in extremes. People don't lose their homes or their farms or their businesses because of the average conditions. They lose them in a storm surge or where a hurricane is pushing high water or heat wave or, or heavy precipitation. And we know much more now than we knew just a few years ago about the way that climate change increases the probability or the severity of different kinds of extreme events. I think those are the things that have changed the landscape and have, in really important ways, but it's not that something was wrong before. This is subtle improvements of the um, understanding and real impacts that are occurring to real people. Well. Give, given that, is there uncertainty? I want to turn to John, uh, John Wyant. Um, is there uncertainty about what we can do about it, either in the mitigation or adaptation thing? Is, is, is that an area of fundamental uncertainty? Or do we have 
or, or do we have some real pretty good knowledge at that and those about those issues? Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, I'm delighted to be asked to be on this panel with the two colleagues here uh, looking at our age dis uh, distribution and these blinding uh, floodlights up here. I kind of feel like I'm at a Fleetwood Mac uh, 30 or 40th uh, anniversary <laughs> tour. I, I, I don't know about me, but these guys can still kick it. So for the youngsters here, and the, the audience seems to be able to rock out pretty well, uh, uh, has done so all day. Uh, so combining mitigation and adaptation together in one question about uncertainty is a little bit overwhelming. Well, let's, so, let's do one. Let's, let's talk about... Pick one. It's real. We, climate change, Chris said, it's real, it's happening. What can be happening in adaptation? Is, is that going to be a major part of the issue, yeah. adapting to the reality? Okay, this kind of connects Chris and I through the IPCC. Uh, I usually do work in the mitigation and emissions uh, projection panels, which is called Working Group 3, for those of you who don't know. Uh, my one excursion, uh, <laughs> which was... A uh, tough job was to be in the uh, work group two, which was on physical impacts, essentially, of climate change. Uh, so that was uh, the third assessment report circa uh, 2000. Uh, and at that point, there were certain economists that Jim and I knew very well that said, what's the big problem? Uh, we've calculated that for two degrees C, mean temperature increase on uh, the surface of the earth, there might be climate benefits that could be uh, uh, economic benefits that would be a percentage point or two. But picking up the themes that Chris left off with here, uh, the problem with that is the whole rest of that uh, working group was organized around sectors and uh, regions where real impacts were already occurring. So there was a, a kind of pivot away from the aggregate calculus that wasn't very good anyway to uh, w what is the um, image that you want to give the policymakers at that point. That led to a, a kind of famous diagram that has, I think, even through the, the round that Chris, run, uh, Chris ran, known as the um, burning embers, which I call flaming embers, which said it's really about unique and in individual systems, extreme weather events, uh, this aggregate stuff. But if you're going to do that, you ought to uh, decompose it by the number of people affected. So even though the aggregate uh, world economic output goes up, 90% uh, of the people who happen to live in poor countries in the south, meaning close to the equator, take it in the shorts and the rest of the people, and we, we, see, we see them, we know them, we love them, we see more and more uh, comes out. Now fast forward, so it was, it was imagined that that uh, inventory that was then decided to put together would be, you know, maybe 20 or 30 or 40 studies that showed impacts that could uh, not be directly immediately uh, related to climate change, but were consistent with what one might expect to see in these regions and sectors. That became about 300 by the uh, AR4. It was how many? A thousand by the time uh, Chris was running the whole panel. You tell me how many were in there. One last thing on this. So those are real and present dangers and a place to look from the bottom up saying, here's the most vulnerable places that we ought to work on adaptation for. And then Chris's group in their chapter 19, which was interestingly parallel to our old chapter 19, pushed the whole enterprise farther by clearly uh, defining the concepts of vulnerability and the potential for adaptation and reframed the whole thing, that whole work group report as a, a, a learning and adaptation, ad adaptive um, a problem of risk analysis. So that was the thing. So you saw increasing mean impacts in the region and sectors unfolding, which was bad, but not that bad. But then if you put in plausible extremes, you got a much more dire uh, consequence. And also, uh, I think this is the way Chris would, uh, and Mike Oppenheimer worked on that chapter, would describe it, much more of a, a, a ability to do deep dives into those really vulnerable sectors where the people couldn't adapt easily and were very vulnerable to see if there was anything that could be done. Okay. Can I just say one yeah. thing about Go ahead. adaptation? The, the adaptation agenda is incredibly important, and there's a vast amount of things that can be done. First, first before you do, but, just say what we mean by so, adaptation. It, it's, that's a really good question, and people mean different things. What, what I mean by adaptation is investments in decreasing the impacts of 
climate changes in order to uh, sustain families, industries, ecosystems. Y you can think about adaptation as uh, investing in resilience and just figuring out how to continue doing the things that we care about with minimum impacts. And, and the message that's so clear in the adaptation space, whether, whether you think about adaptation as improving uh, risk management through insurance products or early warning systems, improving infrastructure, or even relocation, there, there are lots of strategies for adaptations that are tr tried and true, uh, that we know we can deploy if we can limit the amount of climate change that occurs to the low end of the spectrum, something close to 2C. Most of those strategies are no longer relevant if we live in a world of continued high emissions where 2100 we're looking at something like 4C of warming. So the critical thing to understand about adaptation is that it's pretty much binary. It will mostly work in a world of ambitious mitigation, but we really have no clue and it mostly probably won't work in a world of continued high emissions. Is that why, you know, the, the two degrees centigrade maximum rise as a goal has sort of been adopted around the world as what the Paris Agreement was. Where does, that, where does that number come from? Is that a magic number, two degrees? It, it's terrible if we get beyond two degrees. It's okay if we get up to only 1.95 degrees. Uh, what's special about two degrees? And either of you can, yeah. can respond. Well, let me start with just a couple of thoughts. And for me, there are really two baskets of issues that make ambitious mitigation important. And Jim, you already spoke to something that's a, a key feature here. It's not that um, 1.95 is OK and, and 2.05 is disaster. But we know that there are big differences between uh, a world of ambitious mitigation and one of continued high emissions. I already spoke to the issue of adaptation, and I think for the activities that all of us do, whether or not we can sustain something like that is an incredibly important. Uh, for me, there's a, another class of issues that's, that's equally important, and that concerns tipping points in the natural system. And, and there are two categories that are really important. Uh, one is commitment to very long-term changes in the way the Earth system works. And we know uh, with a high level of confidence that there is some temperature at which we become committed to very large amounts of sea level rise. Sea level rise somewhere between 5 and 15 meters over a period of 500 to 1,000 years. That threshold is one that is uh, as far as we know, irreversible once it's passed, even if the climate's cooled down as a result of geoengineering or some other kind of activity. Once we trigger these marine ice sheet instabilities, we're committed. So that's a, that's, and we don't know exactly what the temperature is at which the commitment occurs, but we know we don't want to pass that threshold. Another class of tipping points involves feedbacks where the Earth system starts releasing the greenhouse gases that are driving further warming so that even if human emissions are brought down to zero, climate warming continues. And there's been a lot of attention recently to the risk of large-scale thawing of frozen soils at high latitudes, permafrost soils. Again, we know there's some point at which the warming reaches a level that's sufficient that the melting of these frozen soils generates enough greenhouse gases that the concentrations of the heat trapping gases in the atmosphere continues to increase even if we bring human emissions down to zero. That's another tipping point that we don't want to cross. We don't know exactly where it is, but we have high confidence that we're much safer if we can stabilize warming at something like 2C than if we live in a world of continued high emissions. Good, so, so within that context, the Paris Agreement was used as a uh, target of two degrees maximum with, with a um, examination of the option of, of, of what could we do to keep, keep within 1.5 degrees. John, let me ask you this. Um, are we, given the agreements from Paris, 
Is that apt to keep us within two degrees? Uh, could you comment upon the relationship between the Paris commitments and this two degree target? Okay, this is a little bit uh, complicated. I will start with Chris's point that as temperature increases, not only do mean impacts everywhere, which are very diverse because temperature doesn't change uniformly, um, worse, but you also have a higher probability that you'll hit a tipping point in each and every one of those sectors. Given that, the uh, global modeling community, uh, mostly on the physical science side, have put, has put together these long-term scenarios that get you to two degrees C by the end of the century. Lots of details about whether it need, the temperature needs to be stable, going up, going down, whether you can overshoot those and so on. But that's kind of on purpose. And I think that number was picked because of the work that Chris's work group and others like it have done. Actually, both work group one and two on uh, staying well clear of these uh, tipping points, but still recognizing, I think, the way the reports are written, uh, more uh, risk than we actually experience today because you're going to go up before you go down. So on the where are we with respect to that? So if you take the long-term scenarios that people have developed and you look at not the two-degree pledge that the countries have made, but the actual targets that they have set, both for their own countries, independent of what everybody else uh, has done, or contingent on other nations acting, uh, and, and look at those and where we are uh, so far and where we seem to be headed relative to these long-term trajectories, you're about halfway uh, to where you need, halfway from business as usual baseline down to where you would need to get to in this kind of long run, run uh, approach to a reasonable two degree scenario. Uh, even more troubling though, is if you actually do the uh, look at policies on the books, uh, fuel standards, carbon taxes, whatever people are using, uh, appliance efficiency standards, uh, <laughs> You're, you're gonna, you lose about a half of that. So you're only about a quarter way onto that trajectory. So that's all bad news by far in, in a call for urgency from most quarters. A little bit of good news is those are just short run targets. So the nations of the world actually could redouble their efforts like we have here in California and the EU is doing and so on and get back on track. And that's why verification and transparency of where the, where the actual emissions are now and what the policies are and the projections of what the existing policies, not the hope and a prayer that we'll get to some target without doing anything, where those go. And I think that's uh, a very productive uh, line of research for the modeling community and the people who do kind of the uh, bottom-up uh, assessments is now. There's an excellent report that comes out every November called the UN uh, Environment Program Gap Study, which actually lays pretty much these numbers out each and every year, and they've done so since before Paris. So to, to make sure I've got it right, we have the business as usual projections. We don't do anything. We have what you need to stay at two degrees. And all of the Paris, not just commitments, but the actual policies in place, get you only about a quarter of the way. So, the, so in that, why does it matter if U.S. is withdrawn? Does it matter if U.S. is withdrawn? If, 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 um, if you need to do so much more than even the, that they've committed and U.S., now is projected in the future to be on, only about maybe 15% of the, of the emissions. Why do we matter? Let, let me provide a more optimistic way to think about the <laughs> Paris Agreement, which I would argue was incredibly important. It's important not necessarily for the numeric targets, but for what they imply. So there, there are three visions. You look like kind of a wonky crowd, so I'll give you the wonky version they of are Paris. Justified since you were here, they are. They, uh, so you can think it's about the level. If you think it's about the level, then it's only a quarter of the way. If you think it's about the first derivative of the change, that's the one that John said gets you about halfway. And if you think it's about the second derivative, how, how fast we're changing the underlying mechanisms that allow us to change the rate of change, uh, then we get pretty close to two. And so, I think it's that second derivative framing that's the important one. Uh, when, when Christiana Figueres talked about the Paris Agreement, she talked about uh, raising the ambition. And, and I think more than anything else, the Paris Agreement brought the countries of the world together to decide what's a, what's a fair approach. 
and what's a trajectory for change? What's the second derivative that you need to set in order to solve the problem? The, but the issue is that once every country in the world decides what's fair, if the historic biggest emitter pulls out, you don't really have a deal. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So if you're interested in what is the explanation for this uh, second derivative that Chris talked about, which I think is a really uh, excellent way to describe it, it is all around you. So I think what's changed is people are now more aware of what the problems are that we're facing and what some solutions might be. And I don't mean just technology, which has been a strong response, but also business models and uh, market design and institutional things like that. Often in the modeling world, where we, where we fail to get either something that should happen or shouldn't happen right is we forget about all the institutions, by which I would not include just kind of green NGOs, but markets in various, uh, uh, various um, companies. So I think there's a cause for optimism in that in the second derivative uh, sense. Now on the US in particular, um, as it has been evident here, especially here in Silicon Valley in the state of California, uh, the US government isn't the only engine for change in this regard in the US. Uh, and there are uh, other jurisdictions outside the US, but even within the US, there's the states and the cities and the NGOs and the, uh, the um, strategic uh, corporate alliances that have emerged. So I'm somewhat optimistic. One could turn things around and say, because of the, the lack of activity in Washington, we'll actually wind up doing better than we would have otherwise because all these other entities and institutions will adapt. I'm not willing to go that far yet, but it could happen. And you, again, see that in the faces of the people all around you here. And if we can export that, this is a Jerry Brown speech, right? If, you, if we can export that to the rest of the world, so much the better. We actually hosted, uh, these guys were involved in this, uh, the chief negotiator from the European Union here uh, for a seminar. And we said, would you like to go up to the California uh, Energy Commission and uh, Air Resources Board and compare notes with them on the here and now challenges you're facing in working the climate uh, mitigation equation within the EU with people in California? He said, are you kidding? Screw this seminar. I'm going to just go up there. I said, wait a minute. We're going to arrange this, but you actually have to come back and do the, the do the seminar. And that was just magic. Uh, Diane Grunick, I don't know if she's here, actually uh, a former PUC commissioner here in California, suggested just the right people in just the right offices to help them do mostly transportation and uh, renewable uh, regulations around their cap and trade system. So I think we can still have a big thing. There's, it's kind of the, the uh, Debbie Downer effect of the leaders talking uh, like this isn't a uh, problem, but like uh, the, <laughs> my reading of the trade panel, maybe nobody's listening to them anyway. <coughs> well, um, let me tell just a couple of quick stories, and it, these do actually lead to a question, I'm saying. Um, if we look at energy efficiency, which has been the, the big story in decarbonizing the economy. We have a lot of examples, but one of them in particular is, is airlines. If you compare it to the time of the oil crisis in 1973 to now, we use the airlines, the commercial airlines, use half as much fuel per seat mile as they did. That's not paying attention to whether the seat's full or empty, but we use half as much, and that's because, not a government regulations, but because of, of a group of more efficient uh, technologies, uh, uh, wingless and airlines, better air, uh, and airplanes, better aerodynamics, uh, more efficient jet engines. If you look at the energy use per passenger mile, it's down by a factor of four from that time. It's another factor of two that is totally behavioral. It's the airlines using yield management. You've all seen yield management. Used to be, you know, when I was a youngster, I was always happy that there was an empty seat next to me. Now, if, if once every, ten, every five or 10 flights, I see an empty seat, in my part of the airplane, I'm, I'm happy. And that yield management, um, the dynamic pricing helps get 
keep the planes full. Um, you know what I mean by dynamic pricing. You check the prices of your airline ticket. Uh, uh, it's one price. Two weeks later, you go to buy it, and it's an entirely different price. Well, it's because the airlines are making judgments about how to move people from one flight to another to keep the flights full. Those are happening independent of any government making commitment about about um, um, a Paris. And we have industry has been massive amount of energy efficiency because it's profitable to do that. Cal states like California and New York has taken lots of initiatives going forward. So I go back to the question is, given a lot of this is happening anyway, why does it really matter whether um, the US is a federal government and says in, in, in three more years we're going to have pulled out of, out, of, out of Paris Agreement? Does it really matter or is this all symbolism? Well, the answer is it does matter, and the, it, there are two stories that are really important. One is, as, as you've described, we're seeing amazing progress. And John talked about the investments at the state of California, um, energy efficiency, uh, commitments from corporations like Walmart's Project Gigaton. They're all really important, and when you add all those things up, we're changing the emissions rate at something like a half to a third of what we need to change it at in order to end up in this world of ambitious mitigation. It's not that we're not going to eventually bring emissions down to zero, but if we don't do it until 2150 or 2200, we're going to be looking at an amount of warming that's so large that we will have triggered some of these thresholds. We'll be out of the zone where we can uh, reasonably expect adaptation to work. But what's the full set of strategies that can be used in order to accelerate the rate, to increase the ambition, as we've been describing? And many of those are things that can happen at the scale of cities or families or, or corporations, but some aren't. And the other thing that's really important about the, uh, the role of the US government is that, you know, John and I spent a lot of time in the international context trying to understand how other countries think about their role and their opportunities. And, and it, for a, particularly people from the poor countries to say, uh, you know, I, I'm ready or my country's ready to be really dedicated to this issue in a context where the folks who got rich as a consequence of their profligate use of fossil fuels aren't doing anything does not create a strong motivation. So the, the idea that, oh, well, maybe everybody else will carry the ball, uh, it do, doesn't resonate with any of the conversations I've had on the international stage. And so I, I don't think there's a narrative that says, well, maybe everybody else will just do it. I, the world doesn't work that way. John, do you want to weigh in? Because you've been part of these with the with the energy modeling community uh, looking at that, does does that resonate with you too? Or? Yeah, it does. I, it would be helpful. You know, Jim has this outstanding book that you all read on uh, energy efficiency, looking at this, some of this history that he just talked about, which I think is great. Uh, but I, I I do think there's a danger here in thinking that it's somebody other than the governments that are responsible for internalizing all the externalities associated with energy use and agricultural practices. It is a big collective problem, uh, and some of the, the uh, most ripe fruit nowadays are not individual technologies or individual business models or little fixers, they're systems things. So this would be the, the, uh, the veritable smart grid type solutions, plus a lot of other things like that. We just had the um, ele electric uh, transport and, uh, actually in California and the rest of the world here, I think a lot of those go beyond what individual actors can do. A lot of the discussion this morning uh, spun off both our plenary and the um, 
high-tech panel actually pointed in that direction, is you could do all these little elements, and then you have a bunch of uh, assets kind of on the shelf, but at some point you gotta put those whole pictures together. So two things to me stuck out about that conversation is in order to coordinate, you've got to communicate and build some trust, number one. And it's hard for non-government entities because they are only stakeholders insofar as their country or collection of, of uh, uh, countries are. The other thing that came up again and again is the idea of standards. You need standards, particularly for system solutions, to make sure things fit together, number one, and then on the environmental health and safety side to make sure you don't do nanotechnology that creates rogue nanoparticles that get into people's bloodstreams, just to give one gross example. But there are many uh, things like that where there's a huge public interest, not just in climate change, but in environmental and social issues. And I promised Jim I would stay out of my other favorite hobby horse that I don't know a lot about or in uh, but I'm concerned about, and that's cybersecurity. Well, it, it does seem, and just to expand your point, that there's a tremendous amount of good ideas bubbling up of new technologies, new business systems, new behavioral patterns. Anybody who listened to to this whole event could hear that there's a lot of ideas bubbling up. But the federal government can get in the way of having implement of these new technologies having markets and being implemented, or it can can enhance it. And I guess that's a long-term process that 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 you 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 see happening over many, many years is just some of these uh uh New ventures, some of them will succeed and some will fail. But if we can double the probability of any of them succeeding, we, we have a lot of different... And the federal government, I guess, plays a role in there. Are there any other okay. consequences of what the federal government plays as roles should be in this? Is, is, it, uh, is, is it mostly... Um, the physical changes in the United States that'll be different? Is it mostly how we negotiate with the rest of the nations? Is it mostly how we inspire or depress other nations? What, what's, what, what haven't you covered already in these issues? I, I think all three of those are important. The things we do here, the uh, negotiations and the, uh, the inspiration. You know, in many ways, the the key to solving the climate problem is to have the technologies be cheap enough that they're the low cost option. And the thing we've seen, you know, dramatic progress in the energy generation space as well as in the energy efficiency space is just once things get deployed at scale, creative people figure out ways to make them cheaper and to integrate them into systems and come up with the interconnections. And I think that the thing that we're not doing enough of is driving the deployment to see how cheap the cost can become. And I'm optimistic that with a few more decades of ambitious deployment in the countries that can afford to do it, that the technologies that especially generate electricity emissions-free, they're already the low-cost option in many cases, and they'll certainly be the low-cost options with uh, continued investments in driving the cost down. Oh, oh, John, you can go to it, but I've got some more questions to ask of you, but go okay, ahead. I, uh, this is a thing I wasn't going to bring up, but I think I will. Um, another thing that's important to work all three of these angles, which I think are the right ones, and they need to be kind of broadcast uh, widely, is, um, how shall I put this, um, providing good information to decision makers and um, citizens. Uh, I think we do have a problem. Uh, some might call this fake news, so, uh, but it's not just on the climate side. It's actually on the climate impacts and adaptation side. It's on the mitigation side. So we do, we have some authors here who have actually written about this. In addition to political support for certain uh, political um, parties, um, 
This same group is doing things like right here and now. This was uh, written up a couple of days ago. Are actually doing targeted investment and in political um, uh, manipulation, I, I guess I could call it, or political influence uh, to prevent mass transit systems from proceeding in major U, uh, U.S. Cities, cities. I see this all over. I almost asked, but didn't ask, to the electric car group. Remember the whole who killed the electric car experience here in California? Many of you are old enough. I do worry uh, that despite the governor, uh, the governor's challenge and the utilities um, uh, willingness this time to go uh, aggressively along with that, that there will be a counterintelligence offensive. That will be hard to do in California, but it could happen. And in the rest of the country, we may not get the desired spillover kind of example, example, example uh, effect in those jurisdictions if the information uh, that comes out, it gets distorted in one way or another. Okay. Um let me change gears a moment. We're talking about energy and, and climate. Uh, how much is agriculture? How much is it women and animals and that's coming? Is, is that insignificant or is that an important element of, the, of, of, of how we might need to deal with the climate issues? It's an important element for sure. The most recent IPCC budget had emissions from agriculture being about 25% of total climate forcing and is it comparable to agriculture. And uh, it, it represents some really difficult issues because with, uh, for example, having cows and sheep not release methane, we really don't know what the solution is if, if people continue to want cattle and sheep products. So eventually, that's a, a series of problems we need to solve, and we, we can't uh, put it aside. We can't say, well, we'll deal with that later. It, there, every source of greenhouse gases needs to be tackled. There's one thing that's worth keeping in mind, however, which is that climate forcing from methane, second largest contributor to, to climate change, is really, really important. Uh, methane's a much more powerful gas than CO2, but it doesn't last that long in the atmosphere. The thing we often tend to forget is that warming from CO2 is, as far as we know, essentially permanent. It persists for at least thousands of years and probably tens of thousands of years with very little decrease over time. And the warming from methane goes away. So one, one way to think about that is that from uh, the warming from agriculture, where um, CO2 from deforestation, critically important, and, and nitrous oxide from fertilizer and manure management is incredibly important. But with methane, which is a big part from agriculture, even though it's important and we need to tackle it now, uh, the, the consequences, the costs of waiting are a little less perverse than the, than the cost of waiting on CO2 because of this fact that the warming from methane eventually goes away. That's really good news. I thought you were going to say we're going to all have to become vegetarians. Well, that too. Uh, that, in uh, order to avoid uh, <laughs> rumen and animals, but whew. Okay, so we don't have to all become vegetarians, but it would help, right? A little. Well, I, let's just say that of all the technologies and all the sources of greenhouse gases that we have talked about so far, finding a source of methane-free beef is the one where there are the fewest mature technology solutions. The impossible burger. Well, yeah. Yeah. one little tack on to this yeah. in terms of dynamics is um, if you're going to go really low, if you look at a 2070 or 2080, most analysts think with all of the successes of people in this room and around, uh, you can get the industrial side uh, down pretty easy, meaning you know, uh, uh, and those associated with industrial activity other than agriculture. So at that point, if you haven't done anything about the agriculture, methane or carbon um, releases, it could be in also in uh, unmanaged ecosystems, you got to be, that's all you got left. So that's what you have to work with at that point. So you can't put it off forever. So there is this kind of pleasing dynamic. So if you continue to work on that, and then you're trying to hit a long-term target, you can kind of use the methane as a shock absorber. Because as Chris says, the t stock turnover is whatever it is, and the molecules only last about 10 years. So you could do that. And there's a little debate 
in the other community, which actually reflects different assumptions about how aggressive people are going to be in doing that. So there's kind of a separate dynamic for methane than for carbon, but you can't ignore it if you want to go as low as we need to go by the end of the century. Okay, let's get let's stay with methane a little bit. Uh, major sources of both agriculture and and um, methane releases from oil and gas businesses. Uh, what we release in production of production and transportation and use of natural gas, we, we, we release the natural gas, which is primarily methane. There, um, where in the chain of use is it really mostly coming from? Is this because we frack for natural gas, or is it for some other reason? Well, it, it, you know, there, there have been all these uh, really compelling studies uh, connected with natural gas leaks in big city distribution systems, and you probably read the newspaper articles about the exploding manhole covers. And we really face a, a infrastructure crisis in you know many of our cities where things like the natural gas distribution infrastructure is close to a century old, and there are just all these leaks, and the leaks have been priced into the uh, consumer pricing model uh, and, and resulted in, in people being injured and killed as a consequence. Um, but we also have, a, and especially in the early days of the, of the fracking era, had an industry where there were opportunities for sort of cowboy operators who, who were uh, taking advantage of uh, a loose regulatory environment and using industrial processes that, that were known to not be at the best practices standard. And I think that the real challenge with, with natural gas now is that it can be incredibly valuable. It's, it has already been incredibly valuable in, in squeezing coal, the most polluting fuel, out of the energy space. Uh, but we still are not being as as careful with fracking as we need to be in order to drive the methane emissions down to the to the lowest possible level. It, the frustrating thing about it is that it's not mostly a question of not having the technology. We, kn we know how to do it. Uh, it's not even a question of it being so expensive. It's a question of uh, there being incentives to, you know, skirt the rules or to uh, use less than industry best practices in locations where it's complicated. You use the word we, and I don't think you mean the three of us, but maybe you do. No, I thought you were the big uh, investor in uh, fracking. Uh, I'd say. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm not a vegetarian, <laughs> so maybe that's it. Who's the we? I mean, is, is this like a pogo, we, we've met the enemy and he are us, or... Is there, is there particular actors or particular entities to, for whom uh, they really have to clean up their act in order to deal with the problems of methane releases? And either one of you can yeah, take a crack at on. this. Uh, I don't, uh, fortunately, I don't know if I know the names to names, but if I did, I probably uh, would. Uh, but I totally agree that the research group here that's looked at this has kind of talked about this problem. So uh, on the front end of this, there was this uh, kind of argument about federal versus state regulation. This is kind of mostly within state things, so it should be state regulated. And then you have this immediate problem of the most fly-by-night uh, operator and the most loosely regulated state. Fortunately, I think the industry itself realizes this is a problem because there's going to be ex you know civic unrest if this gets to be a bad problem. So there are, are actually some innovative um, institutional designs involving environmental NGOs and various elements in the gas industry, including a lot of the operators. So I don't know if you meant who is we on the solution side or the problem no, side. No, I mean, what, what is, is, is this, is this um, Shell Oil Company? I won't say yeah. ExxonMobil because there's somebody from ExxonMobil here. <laughs> so he may, uh, was... Or is this, or is this the cities who, who, cities who don't say, hey, uh, we've got to clean up the natural gas pipelines in here? Or is it electric generating plants that use natural gas and has leaking? Really, who, 
who who should you put the pressure on in order to fix to issues of methane leakage? Even though you say it's a transient problem. Transient problem. No, I'm a transient problem. You know, I'm, I'm only going to be here a transient time. Another 12 minutes, yeah. Well, I, I do think that the issue of the methane leakage in urban distribution systems is something where it, it needs to be tackled as an infrastructure problem that falls under this big umbrella of how we uh, restore and maintain infrastructure. That is a critically important discussion in the U.S. and around the world that, that we're not investing anywhere near what, what we need to be. And, and I think that in terms of the uh, emissions from fracking, that, that John got it exactly right. This, it's the, um, the, the, the worst producer in the least regulated area it tends to be the the actor that's the source of many of the emissions. One really encouraging thing that's just happened in the in the tracking emissions from fracking space is uh, recently EDF has uh, has pioneered a commitment to a to a methane monitoring satellite that has the potential to uh, help identify locations where leakage is occurring, and hopefully that will. Uh, provide an incentive for closer looks and identification of, of the of the sources and and the deployment of the technologies to to uh, to capture it. Okay, so we've got to a point with that methane leakage is something that we need a little bit better information where it's going to come from. But if it's rebuilding the whole urban infrastructure. That's going to be massive amount of money, I believe, and and cities are not, many of them are not financially that well off, and the utilities are facing financial problems as well. So the good news, that's the bad news. The good news is it's a transient problem, um, and so we're back to to um, the carbon dioxide controls. We have in in the Environmental Protection Agency a few years ago had an endangerment finding, a finding that, that carbon dioxide endangered, uh, creates an endangered, endangered uh, our economy and human health and so forth. Uh, I hear rumblings that the EPA is going to try to get that endangerment finding reversed. Is there any hope that is, is there any, no, I don't want to use the word hope here because that suggests the wrong thing. Is there a fear that the EPA, under the leadership of Scott Pruitt, may succeed in reversing the endangerment finding, or is that so fundamental, so difficult that that's going to stand? What's your no, prediction? What, what, what do you guys think? Um, actually, I've um, thought about this a, a little bit. So. Um, the uh, uh, a couple things about that. That seems like a hard thing to do because it probably goes back to the Supreme Court undoing the endangerment finding. The easier thing to do, which I was actually interviewed by Stanford uh, EDO, whatever it's called, uh, the day after the, ele the election, is um, undoing the clean power plan was easier to do because it was an executive order, essentially, um, not part of the legal case. Now, the way the law works, as I understand it, is that doesn't mean that the endangerment finding is wiped out. But the the Clean Power Plan was, in part, a difference of opinion about that, uh, kind of pinned to something called the social cost of carbon. What's the marginal damage globally of a, a ton of carbon? And uh, in the way the politics worked out, uh, that's not actually obvious in the the Clean Power Plan uh, uh Section 111B and D uh, proposals. On the other hand, uh, if you actually look in the appendices from that report, you will actually see that those same uh, targets could be justified uh, with um, reference to adjustments in other air pollutants, and air and water pollutants. So you could go that way. So I think it, it is possible that this administration will try to undo all that, but I think Undoing the regular Clean Air Act things, we're seeing them trying to do that, is harder to do. And going back for the Supreme Court, uh, even though the court has shifted composition, which was an issue in the transition from the last administration to, the, to this one, 
So I'm not sure how much mischief uh, could be done, but I'm uh, somewhat optimistic that within this period of time when a single administration is in there, it can't get too bad uh, and there might be some pushback on it. I don't think I can speak to the question of whether it might be overturned, but I can say a couple things about where I see the science background. And, you know, the endangerment finding was that this basket of the six greenhouse gases had a reasonable probability of endangering human health and welfare. And, and when I look at the categories that the administrator of the EPA looked at back in the 2009, it was, you know, it was human health, ecosystems, forestry, energy security, water. And in all of those areas, I see stronger evidence than we had in 2009. Many, many more studies, uh, no thread in any of the research indicating that the uh, risk of impacts was less than people thought in 2009. In many cases, there's a, there are whole new categories of impacts that are coming up in each of these areas, more severe ones, especially associated with, with extreme events. And then there are whole new topics that have come into focus since 2009 that we hadn't really even considered prior to that. Uh, one example is all of the recent research, especially uh, led by Stanford investigators, on link between climate change and violent conflict. And another one is that uh, climate change and ocean acidification had barely come into the radar screen by, by 2009. Uh, California's devastating, horrible experience with recent wildfires is another one where the uh, a whole class of phenomena that hadn't really been in the thinking in 2009 is just coming into focus. So I don't see where there's even an entry point for a discussion about the science about whether the endangerment finding should be overturned. Just to clarify, my understanding of the Supreme Court uh, endangerment finding, it was largely based on IPC, old IPC stuff, in addition to the na uh, National Climate Assessment, which is leveraged, as you well know, leveraged off the uh, IPCC work, but kind of Z you, in those studies, uh, the, the fourth one is now just about ready to come out or just out, uh, zooming in on uh, in much more detail at the U.S., including some of these more recent uh, 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 impacts that people have heard. So it actually would, if precedent drives the law, it would be hard to use precedent as a re as a reason. The derivative again is in the other direction. Okay, to to summarize that, I think there's a agreement that even if the if somebody wants to reverse the endangerment finding the scientific evidence has gotten even stronger that there is a danger to human health and welfare than there even was when there was a, the endangerment finding initially so proving the opposite that there is no endangerment would be very very difficult of course, along that line, we have the proposal from um, the Environmental Protection Agency leadership saying that for the cost-benefit analysis, and you, you know that for the regulatory rules, there's a cost-benefit test that has to be uh, passed, and that becomes part of the legal, legal justification for changing rules. Um, there was a proposal that no longer could we consider the co-benefits of, of climate change, uh, the, the co-benefits, the benefits of reducing the other emissions that are, that are associated with carbon dioxide, the other health and human. Again, that probably will lose because there's a lot of very talented lawyers and a lot of strong NGOs who will push back on a legal front against the elimination of it. But you do see a systematic change towards trying to chip away at the legal processes that are, uh, are getting us towards a, a global climate but, change. But it is important for people to remember that the endangerment finding doesn't have this benefit-cost analysis component. No, it's about that a reasonable it. expectation of damage. But the implementation of particular rules Absolutely. does have that, that benefit-cost uh, 
Oh, I promised time for the audience questions. I just not pay. I blew it. Yes, ask loudly because there may not be time for the microphone to get in there. A comment. <laughs> Is that an understatement? <laughs> Right. I'm going to summarize that because people may not have heard, but with those with microphones, come, come and help those who are asking questions. The question in, greatly summarizes, can, can't we more empower the use of the legal instruments, the courts, to find that, that uh, Scott Pruitt is the head of EPA, is endangering human health. Have an endangerment finding about the EPA is endangering human health and welfare now. Um, can't, isn't there a way of more aggressively using the legal system than we're doing? That roughly, there was a lot more words in it than that. Any thoughts? Well, I think that's happening. I think there are more than a dozen state attorneys general now that, that have suits that are working their way through the system. You know, I, I guess I would respond to your question by saying this is kind of an all hands on deck environment. We ought to be using every opportunity and every avenue that's available. And if, if the courts turn out to be a productive one, uh, that would be really important. Um, David Hayes, who was a, a visiting law school professor here for a couple of years, is, is now leading an effort that's based at NYU in order to make sure that the state attorney generals have all the information they need in order to wage the most effective cases. And I, I don't know the status of any of those, but, but a number are proceeding. Okay, um, I see Greg Low. Most people I can't see because of, but I can see Greg right here. So if somebody uh, uh, bring the and Greg, just wait a moment till till we get this. And I'm going to cut into my closing comments grossly to allow some questions from the audience here. So I'll have a very short closing comment. Okay, I want to ask Chris a question which is relevant to whether uh, Jim should become a vegetarian or not. <laughs> and, and the question has to do with the leakage of methane, whether it's from cattle or from leaky pipes or whatever. And that is that even though you said that the methane decays in about 10 or 12 years, to ha has a half-life, it doesn't completely decay, but, it de but that methane, which is not burnt, it just goes into the atmosphere, when it decays, it becomes CO2, I believe. So it adds to the CO2, so we haven't solved the problem. Yes, that's, that, that, that's, that, it, that's exactly right. But, you know, when we, uh, when we do our greenhouse gas budgets, we, we typically count a ton of methane as having 30 times the greenhouse gas forcing of CO2 on a 100-year time frame. You could argue whether that's exactly the right way to do it, but that's the the standard way we do it. And uh, one other thing that's, that is worth bringing into the conversation is that you know, ultimately we may decide that there are some sources of heat trapping gas emissions that we can't deal with. And if we want to stop climate change, we're gonna have to be removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere or doing some other kind of geoengineering. And, and I think we, we do wanna to continue to look at technologies for, for negative emissions. Personally, I'd be 
thrilled if we come up with a solution portfolio that doesn't require them. But at this point, some of them look like they're going to be hard enough, like aircraft emissions, that it would be wise to continue to invest in, in technologies for capturing CO2 and other gases from so the air. Should he become a vegetarian? <laughs> He, he yeah, may decide okay. to do it for okay. health reasons. I will, I'll give Paul David the last question. Under the condition, the question is short and can have short answers. And not about being a vegetarian? Right. Yes. Got to yes. be a yes. short yes. question. No, we have to do short answers. Yes. I wonder whether the two experts would say um, whatever it is uh, they think is worth saying about the implications of the commercialization of direct air capture, uh, which in which there are two plants under construction in Georgia, uh, each with capacity of a million tons per year, and taking that in connection with the uh, the revision uh, of Section uh, Q45 uh, of. 2008-2009 legislation uh, which offered subsidization um, for what is now included uh, direct air capture and uh, and sequestration. Uh, those uh, are tools added to the tool set and the question is what is their impact on, on existing medication policies? We'll turn to Chris for that answer and that will be the last question. Chris? Section 45Q says that uh, for either enhanced oil recovery or for direct air capture, you can get a tax credit of up to $50, well, $50 a ton for, for uh, sequestration. I believe it's up to $25 for enhanced oil recovery. Maybe wrong on the exact numbers. But um, I, I think that where, where I would say we are with the technology for direct air capture, there was a paper last week that, with a partial cost accounting, said that the it may be practical to do it at a cost that's somewhere between $100 and $250 a ton of CO2. That was a partial cost accounting, and so the actual cost is likely to be somewhat higher than that, potentially a lot higher than that. And uh, right now, that's very far from being the cheapest technology to deploy. I'd love to see continued investment in direct air capture. The real enabler of direct air capture, assuming the technology prices continue to come down, is having abundant emissions-free electricity in excess so that we could use it for this. And if we had abundant emissions-free elect electricity, our other problems would tend to go away as well. So uh, it's really important to, to continue to invest. What we want to avoid is a situation in which we justify current high emissions on the expectation that a technology that is far from mature now will mature some decades into the future. And that's the way I would characterize not only direct air capture, but biomass energy with cap carbon capture and storage as well. Okay, and it gives John so, the last word. Uh, so I'm an all of the above guy, but you gotta do it strategically, as I think Chris uh, just said. Uh, uh, so I, I'm for continuing to explore at its uh, stage of development, CDR, CCS, and nuclear. Um, it is also in interesting to note that 45Q regulations have actually been strengthened by, they were Obama era regulations or subsidies, or, and now have been strengthened earlier this year by the current administration. So maybe there's some faint cause for hope uh, out there. Okay, and I want to thank my, the two panelists for stimulating.